They say the best things in life are free. And that, that sounds nice. It's a really nice statement. Uh, but now with a few decades under my belt, I've got to tell you guys, this is nonsense. This is crazy. Kids are one of the best things in life. Anyone have kids out there? Let's see a show of hands. Anyone have kids? They're the best. Free? No, 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 no. I'm not even just talking financially. I'm talking about emotionally. I'm talking about physically draining. I'm talking about that Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, pull your skin right off of you, transfer of life from me to this child <laughs> being pulled in. I've aged 10 years in the 18 months that my son has been alive. <laughs> And in a couple months, baby number two will be on the way. Yes, I'm so excited. And I just got the first ultrasound bill. Free? No. Not at all. Well, in my 20s, I developed a, a reasonably good reputation as a guitarist. Free? No. Uh, any musicians out there? Wait, hold on. Any wives of musicians out there? That's the better question to ask. Free? And no. Not just the gear, I'm talking about the time, the hours spent practicing, the hours where you think, how loud are those guitars going to be? Not me, of course. <laughs> those hours uh, spent away at rehearsals. I'm thankful for our band, for our worship team. How about we just give it up for our team? They're awesome. For me, it was, uh, we would go on tour and it would be miles upon miles locked in a stinky van with creative types. <sighs> Don't get me wrong, it was, it was great, but free, no. So instead of, instead of this, in fact, why don't we just cross that out, just cross that out, I would say it like this. Anything of value always comes at a cost. And value is always determined by the price someone is willing to pay. Look at what that passage says uh, that we opened with. Jesus says right here in Matthew, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus set the ultimate example for losing his life. Pastor Rick gave us this preview on Sunday. And the Apostle Paul ta uh, taps into the prophet Isaiah uh, to give us a glimpse of something. We can skip two more over projection. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. But look at what he says in Isaiah. Uh, I think we've gone too far. Let's back up. Back me up, Tim. There we go. Philippians 2, 5a. Let's check this out. Just as I said. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be selfishly exploited. Uh, instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But why? What would drive the Son of God, the heir of eternity, to set aside his glory, to be humiliated in what we know to be historically the most brutal execution method ever conceived? Hebrews 12 gives us a glimpse. It says this, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross for the joy. This is an echo of a parable Jesus himself Told. Check this out. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Everyone say field. field. We're going to remember that word, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The next verse says, again, the kingdom of heaven. The next verse says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, remember that phrase too, when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And on the surface, 
This parable seems like a call for us Christians, but Jesus always sets the example for what he calls us to. Check out what it says. He found one pearl of great price. He went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus never calls us to do something he would not also do. He calls on Abraham and says, Abraham, would you be willing to give up your son? Of course, we know God wasn't looking for the sacrifice. He was looking for the heart. But God says, you know what? I am willing to sacrifice my son. God is the one who says to Hosea, I want you to stay married to an unfaithful wife, just like God himself has stayed in this marriage covenant with, with sinful men and women, you and me. So what did we just sing? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. So what was Jesus' pearl of great price? I'd like to suggest tonight that you and me and you and you and you, you were the joy worth the cross of the cross. You and I, sinners made sons and daughters. We were the pearl in the field that he sold everything for. Check out this part of the verse. In Matthew 13, we'll jump back in. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Everybody say field. I think the Apostle Paul is cluing us into this in 1 Corinthians. Here in 1 Corinthians 3, it says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's... You are God's building. How awesome is that? We're that field. He said in that field he found hidden treasures. And I believe you're a hidden treasure. I'm a hidden treasure. You're a hidden treasure. And he gave up all that he had to purchase that field for himself. He lost his life so that we could find ours. Pastor Rick touched on this on Palm Sunday, that we were the joy set before him, that joy for which he endured the cross. Remember what we said, anything of value always comes at a cost. And value is always determined by the price someone is willing to pay for it. And Jesus paid the ultimate price. The Son of God, the creator of the world, on a hill you created, that's what we sang, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. That verse of that song is so gripping to me. I think about it. The creator of the world there on that hill, I am so blown away that Jesus fashioned the very seed that would become a tree that would be cut into lumber to form a cross that he would be crucified on. That's the God you serve. A God so vast, so infinite, he knows every star in the universe and so involved in the details that he knows the very molecules inside its seed that would become a cross. I don't think we can ever fully grasp the sacrifice of Jesus. Shall we read the accounts of eyewitnesses in the Bible? We have the movies. We sing the songs. But at the end of the book, the angels are still saying forever and ever. Look what it says in Revelation. They're still saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. With your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. They're shocked. This is revelation. It's all said and done. It's all over. And still, after eternity has passed, the angels cannot get over this shock that they face. They were shocked. I don't know what the last 12 months of your life have been like, but I've been shocked. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm to the point where I almost can't be shocked anymore. But that's nothing compared to what the angels witnessed. They saw mankind, God's creation, willfully turn its back and disobey and say, uh, you know, God, we would rather have what we desire than what you've told us not. They gave up relationship for their own selfishness. And the angels watched as God made a covenant with man. And he set up uh, this incredible system as, as a symbol to reconcile God and man with sacrifices. And I can imagine the angel saying, that's good. That's, very, that's generous to bring them back in through sacrifices. But then what shocked all of heaven and is still shocking them and will always shock them is that God gets off the throne and says, I'm going to fulfill the covenant. 
I will be the sacrifice. The one who was wronged lays down his life to repair that relationship. I don't know if you've ever let anyone down. I have. And how incredible it is. Imagine getting a speeding ticket and then they write you a check. This is how insane this is to the angels that they watch and they say, we cannot believe it that we still are stuck on the sacrifice there on the cross forever and ever. I believe the heavens know things that we can't grasp in this dimension. They know fully, fully who Jesus is. We've only seen him depicted uh, in the form of man as flesh and blood, but they know the king of infinite glory. They can see it. And I'd like to propose that they know that Jesus suffered so much more than human eyes have ever seen. That on the cross, the cross, he took on not just our sin, but he took on our shame, our disease, our loneliness, our mental anguish, depression, everything nailed to the cross. Like it says, by his stripes, we were healed. Theologians say this means there's healing in the atonement. Whew, that's deep. That's deep stuff. Healing in the atonement. So Jesus carried the cross. Let's just have a look at it. I, I've been searching the building and I could not find a cross that fully just portrayed the vast epicness of the cross. Jesus was the sacrifice. And Bill Johnson says that sacrifice is the step beyond inconvenience. Carrying the cross was more than just an inconvenience. It was painful. Jesus was despised by his own family, falsely accused by the religious proud, mocked by the very people he was trying to save. I love what that song says, how deep the Father's love. It was my sin that nailed him there. His own friends, who he had spent the last three years doing life with. They were getting their undergraduate degree with the perfect professor. Think about that. Think of your uh, relationships maybe here with a mentor, maybe a spiritual leader. They got to spend three years learning from the Son of God. They had just had the best small groups dinner of their life with the Last Supper. But even still, they abandoned him. They were cast aside because of fear. I'd like us to walk through a little bit of the journey of the cross. So we started right here. That for the joy set before him, Jesus would face the cross. And as he carried that cross, he was despised and abandoned by family and friends. Check out what it says in the book of Mark. Mark 3, it says this. Jesus entered a house and a crowd gathered so that his disciples were not even able to eat. And when Jesus' family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. There's something gripping about that. The king of infinite glory who humbles himself, who makes himself in the form of man, puts himself in a family surrounded. And even as he's reaching success, those family are saying, he's out of his mind. We're, we're going to take care of this. Before he faced the cross, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, look what it says in Matthew. Peter says to him, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Peter was Jesus' right-hand man, at least according to Peter. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. But now fast forward only 21 verses later to, to verse 56. Jesus is being arrested in the garden. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. When the going got tough, when swords got involved, when it was going to take some courage, when there was some blood involved, when the going got tough, the tough got going, going, gone, they're gone. They peaced out. I'm going to give you guys a Bible study tip here. When you're reading the Bible, a great question to ask is, why would someone write this down? 
Why did they include this? So here's just a quick Bible study tip for you guys. There's an account in the book of Mark, and it says that when they were arresting Jesus and his disciples in the garden, that they grabbed one of the followers, and he was wearing a linen robe, and then he just slipped out and ran away naked out of the garden. That, my, that verse always blew my mind. You'd be reading that, it's Good Friday, and you're like, and then he slipped out of the robe and ran out of the garden naked. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with Good Friday. Seems kind of inappropriate that you've included that in your sermon tonight, Daniel. But a great question is why would someone include this in the Bible? And I think it's to give us a little hint, pointing all the way back to another garden where a man and a woman ran away from a garden naked. They ran away from relationship because they were scared. And in the book of Mark, it's telling us that another person ran away, ran away from relationship with Jesus because of fear, ran away naked. I think the authors are trying to show us that Jesus is about to solve a problem that has started from the very beginning. They're giving us a clue that in one garden, someone ran away and in another is happening again, but something's about to change. <clears throat> Despised and abandoned by family and friends. He took another step and was misunderstood and falsely accused by religious people. Mark 3, it says this, And the teachers of the law came down from Jerusalem and said, Jesus, he's possessed by the devil. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. That's crazy. Imagine being the Son of God here to save a people, and this is what you received from the priests of the religion who supposedly worship you. What? When Jesus was being uh, on trial, he had been arrested in the garden, and now he's standing before the religious council. It says uh, this here in Mark 14. The chief priests... And the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Many. The next verse says, many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Despised and abandoned by family and friends and then misunderstood and falsely accused by religious people. He left the garden, he stood trial, and then he was marched up the hill, mocked by the ones he was trying to save. Check this, what it says in Luke 23. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. The people said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah the chosen one. These are people he created. When Jesus was put on the cross, he's taken the next step. Matthew 27, it says this, in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Oh, we know the good news of this story. One of the, the thieves that was crucified next to him found salvation that day, but he was still mocked by the ones that he would ultimately save. And finally, I'm going to just scoot this over. He carried the cross. Philippians 2, verse 5, it says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. We read that earlier, and here's what the next verse says. Therefore, God exalted him, to the highest place and gave him the name above all names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Rewind back to the very first one. 
Verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind, this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. I want to talk tonight about two crosses. The first one is the cross, capital C. Just have a look at it. The cross. Like I said, I searched this building high and low. I could not find a cross that fully depicted the gravity of it. So we're going to look at it there. The cross, capital C. And then a second cross. Our cross, little c. First Peter 2 says this, For to this you were called, check it out, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they heaped abuse on him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats, but entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Here it is. By his stripes you are healed. Let's rewind back to verse 21. For to this you were called. Uh, verse 21. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. We carry our small cross not to earn salvation. We carry our cross because of salvation. The price was paid for us at Calvary, the cross. Have a look at it. The cross. Salvation was paid for us there. And our response to carry our small cross, that's called worship. Worship costs something. Did you guys know that? You might say, I thought worship was, was singing a song. Singing a song is like writing a check. Worship is like having the bank account balance to back it up. And it costs something. So let's follow. So let's follow the path of two crosses. Jesus carried the cross for the joy set before him. He was despised and abandoned by family and friends. He was misunderstood and accused by religious people. He was mocked by the ones he was trying to save, and he still carried the cross. But that wasn't the end. The cross is just an arrow that points to the resurrection. There was power in the resurrection. There was a resurrection power, Pentecost power, creative power, raise the dead, heal the sick, open blind eyes, turn prostitutes into prophets, turn demon-possessed into evangelist power. Because of that Holy Spirit resurrection power, Jesus empowers us to carry our cross. We carry our cross, but we don't have to carry it alone. Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit because of his death and resurrection. This is what he said in Mark. He said, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. He gives us that Holy Spirit power to be able to carry this. He's working inside of us. And he's got brothers and sisters to come alongside of us. They're called the church. Check this out. Matthew 28. For where two or more are gathered in as followers, I am there among them. Galatians 6 says, carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us a supernatural grace found in community so that we can carry this cross together. Can I tell you this? No one can carry their cross alone. Oh, I don't think you heard me. No one can carry their cross alone. And we don't have to. He sends helpers. Where's my helpers at? Where's my helpers at? He sends brothers and sisters, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters to help us to carry the cross where two or more are gathered in his name. The Holy Spirit is there with him. And then he sends brothers and sisters to be the church and to carry your cross with you. There's no such thing. 
There is no such thing as solo Christianity. Didn't you guys hear? This is Easter together. So we can carry our cross and we can be mocked by the ones we're trying to save. We can be misunderstood and falsely accused by religious people. We might even be despised and abandoned by family and friends, but for the joy set before us, we can carry that cross all the way to completion. I have decided to follow Jesus. What if it meant more than I have decided to identify as a Christian? I have decided to follow Jesus. What if it meant more than just I've decided to attend church on Sundays? Man, how often I've gotten that confused as we've sang. I have decided. What if it meant that I've decided to follow in Jesus' example of loving people that I would rather write off? No, no. He carried the cross. And now we can carry ours. Carrying your cross is going to cost you. Carrying a cross is risky. It'll weigh on you. You will probably get hurt. You'll probably be mocked and misunderstood, maybe even by the people that you're trying to reach. We might be mocked by the ones we're trying to save. We will definitely be misunderstood and falsely accused by religious people. Look at what it said. At the height of Jesus' popularity and ministry success, back in Mark, the very first that we read just before, it says the teachers came down from Jerusalem and said, this Jesus is possessed by the devil, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. When this auditorium is bursting at the seams and can't contain the number of people who have found Jesus, don't be surprised when religious people say, they're only successful because of the devil. You know what's really going on at that church. Can't trust them. The devil was once an angel too. Ooh. Oh, please. <laughs> We're in good company. Jesus said, they mocked me. They'll mock you. You know, religion thinks in terms of competition. They think that reaching people is about competition. Can I tell you this? If all the unsaved people in Illinois got saved tonight, there wouldn't be enough churches in the state to contain them. We'd have to have 13 church services to have them all. That's what religion says. Misunderstood and accused by religious people. When you're carrying your cross of worship, you might even be despised and abandoned by family and friends. Jesus was. Go back a few verses. When his family heard about this, they went to take hold of him and said, our brother Jesus is out of his mind. When you decide to follow in Jesus' example and it hurts and it costs, don't be surprised when people who are like family call it quits. Don't be surprised. Can I tell you this? If God isn't calling you to sweat a little bit, you might want to double check who's calling. If God hasn't led you to do something that you don't want to do, you might need to ask, who's actually leading? Mm, that's free. <laughs> Matthew 26. Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. All the other disciples said the same. And of course, we know what 21 verses later says, all the disciples deserted him and fled. I need to tell you, people will let you down. Don't put your hope in them. Even pastors and leaders will disappoint you. I promise they will. Oh, how quickly we develop bitterness when Imperfect men and women fall from the pedestals that we place them on. The disciples had literally a perfect leader, and they fled. Don't be surprised when you're carrying your cross of worship that you can be despised and abandoned by family and friends. Peter, 
the executive pastor of Jesus of Nazareth Ministries Worldwide, Inc., denied Christ. Jesus still carried the cross, and he's given us the strength to carry ours. And all this for what? For the joy set before us. Can I tell you this? They are the joy worth the price of your cross. Jesus gives us the power. He's given us that resurrection power, that world-changing power. And he says, carry your cross. And when we reach the end of our journey, it's just the same for the joy set before us. That's why the fire in our heart burns hot when Pastor Rick and Margie say that we are a church marked by gracious acceptance. When we say we're done playing church, we want to be a church that unchurched people love to attend, that they can find Jesus and leave changed. There is more. And it's found in a community of servant leaders who, just like Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay down their life so that Jesus can have his full reward of sons and daughters. But don't they know what kind of person he is? Don't they know what she's done? Jesus knew about you. Can I encourage you? If the weight of your cross seems too great, you need a greater joy set before you. I'll tell this side of the room. If the weight of your cross seems too great, you need a greater joy set before you. Anything of value always comes at a cost. And the value of something is always determined by the price someone is willing to pay. So, a hundred thousand people right here in the Metro East who don't know Jesus. What's their value? What price are we willing to pay? What if the cost is putting aside our preference? What if the cost is being falsely accused by other Christians? What if the cost is friends and family who we love saying, it's just not how it used to be? In that opening scripture that Madison read, Jesus said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus saw you and me as the pearl of great price, worth giving everything for, that we were treasure hidden in a field. And now he's calling us to follow in his example. Last scripture, John 4, 35, it says this. I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Have you decided to follow Jesus? So I'm going to lead us in three prayers tonight. And you can get in on one or all of them. And the first prayer is for someone who's here or maybe watching online, and you stepped into this service feeling worthless. Maybe you don't even know God, or maybe you know all about him. Maybe you've been attending church for a long time, but you don't know him. You don't know his heart for you. This first prayer is for you. If tonight something has come alive in your heart, and you maybe for the first time have heard God say, you were the pearl of great price that Jesus sold everything for to purchase back for himself. Tonight, I'm gonna to invite you to pray that if you'll commit your life to him, he'll respond, that he'll give you the Holy Spirit, that he'll strengthen you, he'll empower you. And not because you're good, but because he's rich in mercy. Not because you deserve it. Good Friday is not because we deserve it. In fact, it's quite the opposite. While we were still sinners, Jesus loved us and died as a ransom 
for many. And so I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you want to get in on that and turn your life around and dedicate your life to Jesus or maybe dedicate it again, I want you to join in with me. We're all going to say it together as an encouragement. So if you're here and you want to make that stance and you want to say, maybe for the first time, I have decided to follow Jesus. This is for you. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for sending your son. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask for salvation. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that I could be adopted, reborn into your family. I admit I've done wrong, but I want to live for you. Jesus, come into my life. I make you Lord, and I will follow you for the rest of my life and forever. Amen. Can we celebrate with anyone who said that prayer tonight? A second prayer that I want us to get in on, and that is that God would open our eyes to see the value of unsaved people the way that Jesus saw the value in us while we were still sinners. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Let me see your love in people that I would rather write off. Let me see your beauty in the very sons and daughters that you died to save. If you gave your life to save me and you gave your life to save them, Lord, may I have your eyes. Let me see how you see. Let me love how you love. And this third prayer, God, would you give me that Holy Spirit empowerment to follow Jesus' example as a sacrifice, to take a step beyond inconvenience, to put aside my comfort and my preference to reach the lost. God, would you work in our hearts? Would you be giving us divine appointments? Would you be knocking on the door of our hearts and saying, this is that conversation. This is that person. This is that chance to lay down your life. God, would you give us the strength to follow you, to be led to do things we would rather not do, but to live sacrificially because of your sacrifice on the cross, that heavy cross, our weight of sin. Now we have the power to carry our cross, that beautiful cross of worship, that we can walk the same path you walked from death to life, from darkness to light, forward, backward. God, we thank you that you made a way for us and that we've decided to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.